Law Day celebration here at Dartmouth is generously supported by the Dartmouth Lawyers Association and planned by the Dartmouth Legal Studies Faculty Group and the Dar in, in conjunction with the Dartmouth Lawyers Association. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge Howard Morse, who is here somewhere, the immediate past president, there he is, immediate past president of the DLA, and Hal Rabner, is he here? Who uh, established some of the lectures, the named law lecture endowments, and is also an active member of the DLA. I want to remind everybody who's here that uh, tomorrow, May 5th, from 3 to 4.30 p.m. in this room it will be a Law Day panel uh, entitled Electronic Search and Seizure, Balancing the Government's Need for Information and Citizens' Right to Privacy in an Age of Terrorism. And the panelists will be Ernie Babcock, uh, Class of 70, former Deputy General Counsel and in Investigative and Administrative Law Branch of the FBI, and Senior Counsel at Eaton Peabody in Portland, Maine. Deirdre, Deirdre Daly, class of 81, U.S. Attorney, District of Connecticut. Timothy Edgar, 94, Senior Fellow at the Watson's Institute for International Studies and Public Affairs at Brown University. And Judge Meyer, who will be giving our lecture today, who is a U.S. District Judge for the District of Connecticut. So today we're here for the Volk Lecture. Uh, this lecture series was established in 2004 by friends and colleagues honoring Stephen Volk, class of 57, chairman of Credit, Credit Suisse, first Boston, and form formerly from Sherman and Sterling. And previous Volk lectures have ranged from legal academics to practicing lawyers and judges to solicitor generals of the United States. They've included Kenji Yoshino, Martha Minow, Michael McConnell, Don Verrilli, Heather Gerken, and Stephen Bright. Today's le Volk lecture, lecturer will be Judge Jeffrey Alkermeyer. Judge Meyer is a U.S. District Judge for the District of Connecticut, sworn in in 2014. He graduated from Yale College, served as a Fulbright Scholar in Ecuador, and went to Yale Law School. After graduating from law school, Judge Meyer served for, as a law clerk for Chief Judge James Oakes of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit here in Vermont, or almost here in Vermont. Uh, and for Associate Justice Harry Blackman of the United States Supreme Court. Judge Meyer began his practice career in 1992 as a staff attorney with Vermont Legal Aid and later as a corporate litigator in Washington. Uh, and from 1995 to 2004, he served as an assistant U.S. attorney with the United States Attorney's Office in the District of Connecticut. He then served in New York from 2004 to 2005 as senior counsel to the Independent Inquiry for the United Nations Oil for Food Program in Iraq. Uh, from 2006 to 2014, Judge Meyer was a professor at Quinnip Quinnipiac University School of Law, and from 2010 to 2014 was also a visiting professor at Yale Law School and uh, taught the Yale Supreme Court Adv Advocacy Clinic. His scholarship has focused on federal reg regulatory crimes as well as the extraterritorial application of U.S. law, and he currently co-teaches the Constitutional Litigation Seminar at Yale Law School. Judge Meyer has stellar credentials, but they don't tell the whole story about him. I've had the <laughs> privilege and pleasure of interning in, in Judge Meyer's chambers, and uh, at least in my humble opinion, you couldn't find a more incisive and analytically astute legal thinker and writer, and you could not wish for a more humane and compassionate person to sit on the bench. So no matter how broken our legal system may be, and what I learned in, in law school is how broken our legal system may be, um, it really heartens me to know that people of his caliber are willing to devote themselves to public service and to the pursuit of justice. So I think you're all in for a treat as Judge Meyer gives the Stephen Volk lecture uh, entitled The Fourth Amendment in Jeopardy, Privacy versus Security in the Electronic Age. And, and thank you, uh, Adina. And, um, and just the chance to work with you, Adina, was really a, a great pleasure. Uh, just to, would, uh, Adina was studying for a year at Yale Law School. Uh, and was looking for a place to uh, see the court uh, system in action, and I was so lucky that you were able to uh, work uh, with me in chambers for some period of months. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, Joanne Needham for uh, uh, graciously hosting uh, me uh, today, um, and I see as well that uh, it came as some surprise to see that this was the Nelson A. Rockefeller uh, 
uh, center. I don't have particularly good memories of Nelson Rockefeller, and I'll tell you why. Um, uh, it's when I was seven years old, uh, my father was a state legislator in New York, and Governor uh, Rockefeller, then governor of New York, uh, invited my father and his family uh, to come into his office in Albany. And I remember walking into this uh, remarkable office, high ceilings and everything, and seeing the governor and the governor uh, shaking my father's hand, then coming up to me and grabbing me, my seven-year-old Jeffrey Meyer, by the cheek like this, and pincing me uh, so hard that you can, I can still feel that pince. <laughs> I can still feel it, right, somewhere in, in my brain. Uh, so just to come back to the Nelson Rockefeller Center today, it uh, gives me a good memory uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Nelson uh, Rockefeller and all that he, uh, he did. Um, so uh, the focus of my uh, remarks today will be on the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, of course, that amendment provides in very broad terms uh, for the right of the people to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. And uh, my goal today will be to explore a little bit about the, US, the current U.S. Supreme Court doctrine in this area and, and ultimately to suggest that in some ways that doctrine is, is unfortunately obsolete to meet the new challenges that we see uh, for, uh, for privacy in our electronic uh, age. Um, I will say a disclaimer uh, for the record. I sit as a U.S. District Judge. I'm not here uh, as in my capacity as a U.S. District Judge. Uh, I, uh, I will not comment on any pending cases. Uh, nothing I say today should be interpreted as some sort of an a, a, a opinion about a pending uh, case um, or to suggest in any way that I would depart from any of uh, the uh, currently applicable uh, Fourth Amendment doctrine I'm bound to follow uh, under the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, um, judges and justices have long grappled uh, with uh, how it is that the Fourth Amendment uh, should apply uh, in the context of changing technology. It was nearly 50 years ago uh, that Justice William Brennan, pictured up here on the top left, uh, uh, said as follows. He said, electronic surveillance is the greatest leveler of human privacy ever known. Now, that was 50 years ago, That's before the internet uh, comes along, uh, and many of the modern technological devices that we have today. Uh, but if you go back even further, and you go back all the way to 1928, and you look at uh, uh, Justice Louis Brandeis, Louis Brandeis uh, on the top right uh, there, uh, he said as follows in his infamous, or excuse me, famous dissent uh, in the matter uh, of uh, Olmstead versus the United States. He said, in the application of a constitution, our contemplation cannot only be of what has been, but what may be. Uh, may, ways may someday be developed by which the government, by which the government, without removing papers from secret drawers, can reproduce them in court, and by which it will be enabled to expose to a jury the most intimate occurrences of the home. And he said that in the context of dissenting uh, in a case that uh, one of the very most important uh, Supreme Court cases involving uh, the right to privacy from government wiretapping all the way back in 1928. And so as technology changes, I would suggest that our understanding of the Fourth Amendment has to change. And I think that even Justice Scalia uh, uh, agreed. Um, he said uh, in one particular uh, case, and, and Justice Scalia, as you know, is famous for uh, being, number one, a, a, an originalist, a textualist. Uh, he uh, would declare that, that the Constitution is not a living Constitution. Uh, it has its, uh, its uh, uh, original uh, meaning, and, but even when he was confronted with Fourth Amendment and technology uh, questions, uh, in a particular case involving uh, the police's use of a thermal imaging scanner to scan the outside of a home because the police were hoping, in this case United States versus Kylo, uh, to detect a heat coming out from the home from a marijuana grow operation. So the court was confronted in this Kylo case with whether this was a Fourth Amendment search just to be standing on the public street with the thermal imaging device. And Justice Scalia said, it would be foolish to contend that the degree of privacy uh, secured to citizens by the Fourth Amendment has been entirely unaffected by the advance of technology. 
And he went on to say, uh, while the technology used in the present case was relatively crude, the rule we adopt must take account of more sophisticated systems that are already in use or in development. Okay, so uh, I would suggest uh, that the advance of technology uh, effectively makes for a moving target today. Uh, the target is uh, essentially our own information. It's uh, information uh, that we uh, uh, store or communicate, whether it's by text messages, uh, emails, photographs, our location uh, information. Um, these are is a target that's growing in size because uh, we are more and more storing and accessing our information, not necessarily even from our personal devices, but out there on the cloud. And we'll talk a lot about that uh, today. Um, and on the other hand, so we have a target that's getting bigger, but we also have a government uh, that is adopting and, and, and having access to the growth of technology as well in terms of enhanced uh, technological surveillance uh, devices. So uh, we have uh, bigger weapons, right? Bigger target, bigger weapons. Um, and, uh, and a challenge is to think about how is it that the Fourth Amendment would apply in these contexts. So I want to um, uh, get down to thinking about this challenge in specific types of factual situations, and I'll suggest two of them for you that, that, that present different aspects of this. Uh, the first is uh, what we all have in our pockets, right? I bet we all have this in our pockets. Uh, we have some kind of a smartphone, right? And so um, uh, the question is, to what extent does the government have a right to search our smartphone, okay? And we can think of that in two ways, right? First of all, to what extent do they have the right to go onto the uh, smartphone and scan the, and search the smartphone for data that may be stored on the phone, okay? And to what extent uh, could the government have, in theory, the right to use the smartphone as a platform for an access point to data that's stored elsewhere, okay? Because uh, uh, the technology is changing such that smartphones now have less and less memory, we store less and less, and essentially we keep more, more and more stuff on the cloud, right? If you're using iPhotos, or if you're using the email systems, things like that, it's stored on the cloud. So we have to be thinking about what's the rights that the government may have in that context uh, to look at that information. Okay, so that's one way to think about uh, the challenge that's presently posed. Another way to think about it is enhanced government surveillance, right? This is the bigger weapons uh, uh, theme that I touched on a moment ago. So the idea is uh, to what extent uh, will the government develop, and may the government develop, as Justice Scalia foresaw, right? More technology that will allow for enhanced uh, uh, surveillance uh, techniques, okay? So you're looking here on, on this particular slide at something that's an artist rendering, I suppose, of something, that, of a drone that can fly over a city uh, with cameras, uh, but uh, that's actually a reality um, in sense of, uh, just last August uh, was a news story about uh, a particular program in Baltimore uh, in which uh, not a drone but a plane was flying over with high sophisticated cameras and essentially surveilling the entire city. I would suggest we're not that far away from a government's ability, not necessarily that the government will want to, but at least the ability, hypothetical ability, to use drone technology in a way that could fly over uh, uh, any areas of cities with sophisticated cameras and even possibly the use of facial recognition technology, okay? So think of those two examples. We'll return to those as we start to talk a little bit about how the doctrine applies uh, in, uh, in this case. But before we talk about the doctrine, I want to talk about the words. Uh, this is uh, on the screen above me is the, the words of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, they are familiar to many of us, but uh, if we take a closer look, I would suggest that uh, it le the words leave a lot unclear. Um, so, for instance, uh, when we think about uh, the protections that the Fourth Amendment gives us, it gives us uh, the, it protects the right of the people, right? The people. So it suggests, in a way, some sort of collective uh, protection. Uh, the Fourth Amendment uh, is often talked about as uh, an amendment that protects privacy, and then even in the, in the title of this talk, it's privacy versus security. Well, the words of the Fourth Amendment say nothing about privacy, but they do talk about security, right? It's the right of the people to be secure uh, in uh, their person, houses, papers, and effects. So it, that suggests 
uh, persons, houses, papers, in fact, limiting essentially geographically in some ways, right, the items that are subject uh, to uh, the protection of the Fourth Amendment. Um, and then there's an odd way that the Fourth Amendment is framed uh, in that uh, it doesn't purport to create a right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure, but in the way it's framed, it says, right, the first sentence, the right of the people to be secure, et cetera, et cetera, against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. So it's almost as if it's referring to some sort of pre-existing right, okay, and then saying that right shall not be violated. Um, and, uh, and apart from that, if we look at that as creating or recognizing a right, its primary protection is against an unreasonable search and seizure. And I would suggest we have to think about whether there's been a search or seizure at all and then decide, right, whether that's been uh, uh, one that's been, uh, would be uh, unreasonable. And then the last part of the Fourth Amendment that I'd point to uh, is the kind of the add-on sentence at the end that doesn't seem to be too connected to what goes on before, right? You say, the rights shall not be violated, and then it goes, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So query, how is it uh, that that add-on sentence connects or modifies, if at all, uh, uh, what it is for, uh, it means for a search to be uh, unreasonable, or what in fact is a search uh, at all? Okay, so that's the Fourth Amendment for us, and of course, as a matter of constitutional uh, law, it's, uh, uh, it's going to be uh, the Supreme Court that decides uh, what the Fourth Amendment means. So I would suggest, uh, essentially, you're looking at, uh, in kind of Hamiltonian terms, the room where it happens, right, from the music, musical, right? This is where Fourth Amendment privacy occurs uh, in the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court uh, ultimately has the review and has expounded the major cases uh, in this area. Now, some of you will say, well, you know, look, uh, the executive branch, Congress also has a say about what privacy rights may be. And I'd say, yes, that is very true. Uh, and occasionally, Congress does act, <laughs> occasionally, uh, in this area. So, for example, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which is, uh, includes the Stored Communications Act, uh, Congress passed that in 1986. 1986. So it's 30 plus years since Congress has passed its major framework legislation uh, to govern uh, uh, privacy. Uh, that was before, that was several years before we had even our first internet browsers. Uh, so uh, uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, we'll talk about a little bit uh, later uh, uh, today, uh, it does provide important protections, but the protections are in general, across the spectrum of media that we'll be talking about, not nearly as complete as uh, the protections that would apply if the Fourth Amendment uh, did uh, apply. So um, in the balance of my remarks, what I want to focus on is four different areas. Uh, I want to look at uh, the, uh, the first question, a uh, number of questions. The first will be, what is it that constitutes a search? And to try to look at the doctrine uh, that uh, touches upon the definition of a search because that's a critical gateway, issue, gateway threshold in terms of whether there'll be Fourth Amendment review of a governmental action at all. Uh, the second thing I'll look at is, well, if there has been a search, has it been an unreasonable one? And how is it that uh, the doctrine applies uh, in that context, uh, possibly in the electronic uh, uh, context? And then I want to talk about uh, what, are, what does it mean for the Fourth Amendment to talk about the rights of the people as opposed to uh, an individual? Uh, should we be thinking about, or should courts be thinking about, uh, the Fourth Amendment in some kind of collective sense, uh, especially if the government is using and does resort to mass surveillance uh, types of, uh, of techniques? And the last issue that I'll, I'll touch upon are what are the remedies, and principally looking at mostly judge-made doctrines that have uh, limited uh, the enforcement of the Fourth uh, uh, Amendment uh, rights or the ability of courts really to reach uh, the merits of adjudicating Fourth Amendment claims. So uh, the Fourth Amendment from the text, as you see, it, it, it protects the right of the people to be secure from unreasonable searches and seizures, which raises the threshold issue of, well, just what is a search? Right? What, what, what do we mean by a, a, a search? Um, if we look at uh, this cartoon, right, we have an FBI agent headphones on, 
uh, wired in some way to somebody working on their laptop uh, computer, is that a search? Is it a search, right? Uh, we might say, well, uh, I don't see the FBI agent looking at anything. He's listening. It's listening in some way uh, a search. Uh, is it, uh, um, uh, does it apply in this kind of context where the FBI agent is not in the same physical space as the uh, a computer user? How do we uh, think about that? And I would suggest that the Supreme Court has addressed this kind of issue uh, multiple times uh, over, over the years. Um, and I'll pick out, among many other cases, uh, what I think are four of the more significant ones that illustrate essentially how the Supreme Court has gotten to where it is today in terms of defining what it, what it is, a, is a search. Uh, the first is the case I already talked about, uh, Olmstead versus uh, United States. Uh, Justice Brandeis was in the, uh, the, the losing side of that. Uh, that case involved uh, a prosecution of liquor, essentially liquor traffickers uh, out in Seattle, Washington, and the government decided to promote uh, the uh, prosecution there. It would engage in wiretapping. Again, back in our Prohibition era, and the wiretapping back in those days, you had to get the agent would go out to the telephone pole, right, and shimmy up the telephone pole, okay, and then take the little clips, literally, and clip them to the wire, or the telephone wires, uh, and then presumably some sort of a he headset, okay, and, uh, and then the question was, well, is that a search, right? It's not, he's outside the house, okay, it's not the papers, it's not the effects, it's not the person, okay? Uh, is he's really searching anything uh, here? Um, a five to four uh, decision of the Supreme Court led by uh, uh, former president uh, Taft as chief justice uh, decides that is not a search, not a Fourth Amendment search uh, that's uh, occurred uh, in, uh, in, that ca in that case uh, over the four justice uh, majority. <laughs> Uh, kind of an all-star lineup in the, in, the, uh, in, in the dissent, including Justice Brandeis, Justice Holmes. Okay, so initially, in the Olmstead case, uh, uh, what is a search is thought of in very geographical terms. Uh, there was no trespass on the house because the agents could climb up the telephone pole outside the house. Uh, fast forward some number of, of years, some number of other cases. This is my, one of my favorite ones, the Silverman case. Uh, from 1961, agents there decided that they wanted to hear what was going on. There were two houses, kind of a row house next to each other. They wanted to hear what was going on in the next house uh, over. And so they took something called, you gotta love it, a spike mic, okay? It's like a railroad spike with a, a, a kind of a microphone, a megaphone sort of device, and they pound it in to the wall of one room and, uh, and they listen. Okay? And what's happened is the spike goes into the wall, it makes contact with the heating and ventilation system of the house next door where the targets are. And, uh, and effectively, by that contact, turns the heating and ventilation system into one giant microphone. <laughs> and they can hear everything that's going on. And there's a motion to suppress in that case. And, uh, and the court ends up concluding, yes, that is a search. Why? It's a search because they had to trespass. They had to invade the, the, the property, right, the house, uh, there in a way that they did not in the Olmstead case. So for many years after Olmstead, all the way up into the late, ni ni late 1960s, essentially uh, the Fourth Amendment and what is a search depends on geograph geography, basically, and, and exclusively so. Um, that's until the Katz case, Katz versus United States, one of the uh, landmark cases uh, in the Fourth Amendment uh, context in which the court is confronted with a claim uh, by uh, somebody who has uh, been overheard by FBI agents. And the FBI agent in that case uh, went to a telephone booth where they knew that a person, the suspect, Katz, was going to enter into the telephone booth and start placing gambling bets. And they took uh, a bug and they put it up on top of the telephone booth and, uh, and using that bug some distance away, it would transport, transmit an electronic, sig electronic signal and they could hear what was going on inside this otherwise public telephone booth, right? Nothing, it's glass and all on the outside. People can tell that Katz is in there and all that. So is that a search? Uh, the Supreme Court concludes in the Katz case, uh, yes, it is a search. 
And the Supreme Court essentially revises wholesale its approach in these cases and says the Fourth Amendment, in Justice Stewart's majority opinion, Fourth Amendment is about protecting uh, persons, not places. Uh, and then in Justice Harlan's uh, famed concurring opinion, uh, he writes, in these kinds of cases, what I understand now the test to be is about whether somebody has an expectation of privacy. So we're switching from trespass now to expectation of privacy. Uh, and it's a two-part test. You ask, did Katz, when he's standing in that public telephone booth, have a subjective expectation of privacy in what he was saying uh, over the telephone to his bookie? Okay, and is it an objectively reasonable one that society is prepared to recognize uh, as reasonable? That becomes the CATS two-part test, uh, focusing on whether there's been a reasonable expectation uh, of privacy. Uh, that test uh, is next considered in major part uh, by the Supreme Court much more recently, in another opinion by Justice Scalia, in United States uh, versus Jones. And in that case, uh, the uh, government uh, places a tiny little GPS tracker and they go up to a car in a parking lot in DC and they plant it under the bumper or somewhere within the car confines, nobody knows, and they use that uh, to track Jones as he drives all over uh, around and, and drives near places where they know other drug deals are going on. And Jones says, whoa, you've broken my, you violated my expectation of privacy. And the government's response is, no expectation of privacy because you don't have an expectation of privacy in where you've driven a car on public roads. And the Supreme Court, in fact, had said so much in a couple of other prior cases in the 1980s. The U.S. Supreme Court, however, says no, no, no. What's happened here is the government has gone on and trespassed, intruded upon the car. And the car is in effect, right? It's one of those protected zones of the Fourth Amendment and use that to acquire uh, information. So basically, today, the modern definition of what constitutes a search, you can think of pictorially. So on the left, uh, you see the four areas that are protected by the text of the Fourth Amendment. That's the person, right? the house, the papers, and the effects. And on the right side, you say, if it does not, it's not an intrusion on one of those, you say, well, has there been, like in the Katz case, we have a phone booth, is there an ex a zone of privacy, essentially, a reasonable expectation of privacy? So that's the governing framework today for what constitutes a search. So query this, how does that apply to the cloud? Right? What, how do we think about uh, what is a search when we have data stored in the ethersphere, right? Or in a Google server room, right? Somewhere in the cloud. Um, uh, do we have an expectation of privacy? It's not our house, right? It's not our papers. Can you say it's our, can you say it's our papers? Or are they digital papers in some way? Uh, how do we apply that? I think that's the challenge that courts uh, face in, uh, in, in, in this context. Now, one way of understanding that challenge is very important to understand another thread of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence uh, known as a third party doctrine, okay? And essentially, the gist of this idea, uh, as the court has articulated in numerous cases, is that what is disclosed by one party to a third party is essentially fair game, or can be, under circ certain circumstances, fair game. Um, so in the ex parte Jackson case, a very oldest case that uh, deals with this, uh, the Supreme Court does make clear that, well, you know, when you send a letter to a friend, uh, the government can't just open the letter if there's been an intrusion on the expectation of privacy. Uh, in other cases, however, when there's disclosure of information, such as uh, in the Mi United States versus Miller case in uh, 1976, the Supreme Court is queried with, well, can the government go to your bank and look at your bank statements and your checks and all the other bank records that, uh, that, that uh, the bank may have about you, or do you have an expectation of privacy? in that area, and the Supreme Court decides uh, no matter what the subjective expectation might have been, it's not reasonable to uh, suggest uh, that somebody should expect privacy in their banking records. No constitutional protection for the banking records. 
Um, in uh, skipping down, a few years later, the court makes a similar ruling in Smith v. Maryland about the expectation of privacy in the telephone numbers that we dial, okay? Apart from, standing apart from the content of what we might say over the telephone, because the Supreme Court has made clear in another case, the Berger case, decided around the time of Katz, that the government cannot listen in on a phone call, real time, uh, uh, without violating an expectation of privacy, just like it can't look at your mail, but it can look at the numbers that you have dialed because those are stored by the telephone company and it's free to look at that information. No reasonable expectation of privacy there. So the court is articulating in this context essentially this notion that what's disclosed to somebody else, you don't have an expectation of privacy, at least in circumstances where that third party is receiving it is doing something with it. Like the bank, it's processing checks, right? Or the telephone company, they have to know the numbers to decide how to connect the call. Now, um, in another case, in the United States, uh, White versus United States, uh, the court is confronted with, well, what happens if the government takes one of its secret agents, an informer or an undercover agent, and they do this, they put one of these wires like I'm wearing right now, okay, and they have the agent uh, 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 go in under false pretenses, right, pretending to be a drug confederate, into somebody's home, okay, listening and tape recording everything that's being said. Um, and is that somehow, the government sending somebody in with a tape recorder into the home without you knowing the person has a tape recorder, under false pretenses, is that somehow a search by the government? And the court uh, there says no, no search. You do not have an expectation of privacy because for all you know, right, your supposed best buddy friend is gonna sell you out, sell you down the river. And he has the right, just as he would have the right to go to the government later on and say what happened during that conversation, nothing changes simply because he comes into your home wired up to do that. Uh, and then the, you know, the last of the cases on our list here uh, I think is interesting is in California versus Greenwood, uh, the government uh, goes after uh, drug dealers by going into trash of the dealers that's left outside the curb of the home. It's off the curtilage of the home, just outside the, on the curb of the home, uh, the government uh, goes through the trash and uh, gets incriminating evidence from that. Uh, the owner uh, says, the defendant says, I have an expectation of privacy in there. In fact, there's no way for me to get rid of what's in my home except by putting it in the trash. In the California law, there was an ordinance that prevented people from burning trash or burning anything. There's essentially no other way uh, in his contention. And I never expected or dreamed that the government would be looking through my trash and getting evidence this way. Uh, court rejects that. No expectation of privacy uh, there. So I, my takeaway from these cases and these line of cases is essentially uh, what we might think of as the, the, the envelope rule. So to the extent that you've got um, uh, information that is inside an envelope of some sort, whether it's physical envelope or whether it's the contents of a communication like a telephone call, um, uh, whether it's the contents of emails. The, 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 the only courts to look at the issue so far have decided that emails are subject to an expect, reasonable expectation of privacy. That's counter to the federal statute, that 1986 statute that I talked about a moment ago that actually said you don't have to, the, the, the government does not have to get a warrant for emails that have been opened or there are more than 180 days old. But the courts have come along and those who have looked at the issue have said emails are protected. But those things that are on the outside of the envelope, like the address uh, on an envelope uh, or um, your Google search queries, right? Google needs those, just like your telephone numbers, to figure out what page you're going to. Presumably, under the third party doctrine, not protected. How about uh, uh, this handy dandy GPS device that we're all carrying on us that, that allows, by cell phone tower location, uh, the cell phone company to know at all times uh, where we are. I would suggest it's pretty compelling. Every circuit court to look at the issue has decided that the cell phone company records of where you historically have been, cell site location information, not protected under the third party uh, uh, doctrine. So that the government can historically go back and recreate where you've been 
uh, sometimes to great effect. And as a trial judge, I see this a lot, a lot of times. Got very powerful evidence in criminal cases before me have involved uh, the government's use of cell phone uh, records uh, to identify where a particular person has been in the proximate area at a particular time, okay? Not protected. No expectation of privacy. Uh, you don't have an expectation of privacy in your banking, your credit card records, or the like. That may come as a surprise to some. I know when I teach the, taught this in law school, my students were kind of aghast. They said, what? <laughs> right? I, can't, I don't have any constitutional expectation of privacy uh, in, uh, in uh, these areas. So I think if we go back to our examples, the cell phone, uh, it would be pretty clear to me, especially after Jones, okay, that the government cannot intrude on my cell phone itself. It's one of the effects, just, no long, just like that car in Jones where they place the GPS on it and search the cell phone because I have an expectation of privacy, reasonable expectation of privacy for which they would need a warrant. And the Supreme Court later in a case I'll talk about, the Riley case, made that clear that they would need to do that. But it's unclear about what's in the cloud, uh, exactly what would be protected. So when the government, if the government uh, goes and does circumvents, right, and goes to my email uh, provider, it may be able to get, or my, my, my ISP provider, it may be able to get my search terms, may be able to get uh, my locational uh, information, may be able to get other kind of subscriber information without Fourth Amendment review, apart from any kind of statutory uh, protections uh, that may apply. The GPS, the, the, the uh, drone, camera, right? Do we have a protection against that? I think the answer there would probably be, under these precedents, no, right? Because all it's showing you is where somebody is on public highways and streets. To the, if, if somehow this were used to enter the home and to reveal where you were inside a home, much more problematic under Supreme Court uh, uh, doctrine. So um, here's my concern about uh, where the doctrine and the courts have, have done uh, so far uh, in this area uh, is essentially how is it, so we can call it privacy's valence, right? Should the courts be thinking of privacy in kind of uh, negative terms of what it sort of rules out? Or do we think of privacy in positive terms? So I would suggest that under the current third party disclosure doctrine, uh, what the courts look at primarily is, um, have you assumed the risk, right? That that informant's gonna come in wired up, okay? That the bank is gonna turn over your records in some way, right? Um, that the uh, government's gonna go to the cell phone uh, company and get those kinds of records. Have you basically assumed the risk that whoever the information is disclosed to when you disclose your information could turn it over to somebody else? Um, essentially, it's, uh, it's thinking about what is an expectation in, in highly um, predictive terms, descriptive terms, right? Essentially, it's looking at um, to what extent uh, could somebody think that they might be subject to uh, having the government look at their records? Uh, I would contrast that uh, sort of predictive, descriptive way of looking at what is privacy and what's protected by the Fourth Amendment with something that's more affirming in terms of that gives positive content, and I'll talk about in a moment, uh, to uh, what it means uh, for there to be a privacy interest. Uh, part of this boils down to the fact that we've geared what is a privacy interest uh, insofar as we're applying the CATS test, that reasonable expectation of privacy, to what it is one expects. So you could think about, well, you know, what does expect mean, right? Expect has kind of different meanings in different contexts, okay? I might, uh, uh, for example, expect that it will rain today. That's a predictive kind of expect, right? Or uh, I might uh, expect better treatment by my friends or my family, right, or my government, okay? That's a kind of normative as opposed to predictive uh, expectation. Uh, when I cross the road, one might say, I might expect that people will speed up. It hasn't happened to me so far in Dartmouth, but might speed up, right, to try to hit me. I could expect that. I've assumed the risk of that, okay? But I expect, actually expect something different. I expect people to live by social context, 
social conventions, legal conventions maybe, uh, and not speed up and try to uh, hit me or to intimidate me uh, in some way. So um, I am concerned that the court's adoption of this model, this predictive negative-ish model of, uh, of what is um, uh, an expectation of privacy uh, diminishes the right. And if we looked at other rights, right, if we looked at the Eighth Amendment's Cruel and Unusual Punishments Clause and we said, well, we'll define cruel by kind of what a prisoner might expect to have inflicted on them, right? Um, uh, they might flog. They've been flogging for years that kind of define it by means of kind of what he assumed the risk to be. The court has taken a more normative approach in this area in looking at uh, what are our society's contemporary standards of decency in the punishment uh, context. Um, that's, that's one kind of uh, example that you might think of. The Fifth Amendment, uh, it guarantees due process before law. So do you look at sort of what the process is that's sort of always applied and what people kind of might have uh, assumed the risk would happen before the government deprives us of life, liberty, or life, liberty, or property? Or do we have a normative standard that expects and demands something uh, in terms of the protections that the government uh, would give us. Um, there's another problem with the uh, expectation uh, of privacy as a predictive, purely as a predictive way of looking at it, which is um, if you assume the risk that the government will send in um, uh, uh, somebody who is going to betray you, right? It's gonna, you're gonna be defrauded effectively by the government um, and misled into letting somebody in to your home who's gonna be wired up against you, well, why haven't you equally assumed the risk that that person, while you're visiting the restroom or otherwise in the kitchen preparing a cup of coffee or something like that, isn't gonna start stealing from you and taking uh, property from you, which the court has made clear cannot happen, right? But you've equally, if you're just saying it's all that what you assume the risk to be, uh, why is you've assumed the risk that the government will defraud you, but you have not assumed the risk that the government will burgle from you or steal from you? So the problem with the assumption of the risk rationale is it kind of goes too far, it proves too much. Um, now, uh, in terms of thinking about, well, what, what can be privacy's uh, positive uh, uh, valence? Uh, I would start with, and I'm not here, I'm not an ethicist, I'm not a philosopher, um, I, uh, I'm not here to, to proclaim or announce some sort of a new definition of what, exactly what privacy is. But if I were going in that direction in terms of giving positive content uh, to what privacy is, I would start again with Justice Brandeis and his dissent in Olmstead, uh, in which he uh, makes clear there that the makers of our Constitution undertook to secure conditions favorable to the pursuit of happiness. Uh, they rec recognized the significance of man's spiritual nature, of his feelings, and of his intellect. They knew that only a part of the pain pleasure and satisfaction of life are to be found in material things. So essentially looking at, well, what's the purpose? Why is it that this uh, 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 Fourth Amendment uh, uh, value uh, exists? Uh, and he goes on to say immediately after that passage, uh, they conferred as against the government uh, in words very famous, words he had coined actually uh, some, some decades before in a famous law, Harvard Law Review article, the right to be left alone. Uh, the most comprehensive of rights and the right most valued by civilized uh, men. And to protect that right, every unjustifiable intrusion by the government upon the privacy of the individual, whatever the means employed, must be deemed a violation of the Fourth Amendment. So it would be a, a, an understanding and an articulation of the Fourth Amendment's values to protect a certain space. Uh, 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 basically, a, uh, as some of the commentators have written this area, a kind of a personal sovereignty uh, that is, uh, uh, is inviolate or at least subject uh, to a legal process before it can be uh, invaded uh, and not to adopt this kind of predictive, more negative way of thinking about it. Okay, so those are my thoughts on what is a search. I'm gonna spend a little less time uh, talking about uh, the other questions I've raised in terms of what is an unreasonable uh, uh, search. And again, that stems from the text of the Fourth Amendment and its emphasis there on, on something being unreasonable. Um, now, um, the Supreme Court uh, has dealt with, in the technology context, its most recent ruling, important, very important ruling, is 
uh, in the case of Riley versus California. And in that case, uh, uh, a suspect uh, was, uh, see, was caught with a cell phone, a smartphone, one of the suspects involved in the case, and uh, the government asserted the right to search that cell phone without having to get a warrant because there is a uh, long established rule under the Fourth Amendment that when some, the government arrests somebody, they're allowed to uh, do a search incident to arrest and essentially search the items. It could be your wallet, uh, uh, it could be your purse, it could be something that's on your person at the time, and to look for evidence and to look for uh, anything that you might destroy in terms of evidence or to neutralize any kind of danger. So the Supreme Court in the Riley case was, set, was faced with, well, do we apply that same search incident to arrest exception to the probable cause warrant requirement of the Fourth Amendment to a cell phone? And uh, in an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, the court uh, decisively says no. In fact, it recognizes that at least as to what's stored on our cell phones, uh, there are significant uh, privacy concerns that warrant treating this something different than, say, just the wallet uh, or uh, a pack of cigarettes or some other item that would ordinarily be in, uh, in one's uh, pockets. And so uh, Chief Justice Roberts says uh, our answer to this question is go get a warrant. OK, great. So that, that clarifies in some sense the protection that uh, the, the warrant requirement in this context to a particular kind of cell phone. Uh, but then the question becomes, well, hmm, uh, does, uh, uh, does a warrant do enough? Okay. In other words, uh, uh, when we think about the text of, uh, of the Fourth Amendment, uh, does it make clear uh, that every time the government has a warrant, that that should be enough for the government to do its search, even if it's a something of the entire cell phone, right? Does it gov does it essentially license the government to do the entire search on the basis of the fact that the government has gone to a magistrate judge and showed that there's probable cause, okay? And probable cause, those of you who are lawyers, you know probable cause is not a particularly demanding standard. Um, it's a standard that's less than the preponderance of the evidence, certainly far less than beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's a standard that's, that suggests that reasonable men would believe that there's criminal activity a afoot. Um, and so the question is, huh, does a probable cause warrant always mean a search is reasonable? Where do we find that in, say, the text of the Fourth Amendment? And this gets us back to uh, uh, my uh, pointing out that odd sort of add-on to the end of the Fourth Amendment. It's one that's historically based in terms of this founder's concern about uh, generalized uh, warrants. But effectively what the Supreme Court has said over a number of cases is that in cases where the government has uh, a probable cause warrant, that's always enough for the government to then invade and do the search in, uh, in that area. And they've done that in large part uh, by essentially equating the second part of the Fourth Amendment with the unreasonableness requirement, right? Um, and so uh, uh, very, uh, uh, when you think about, okay, well, that, that, that's fine. I can see how the court would do that. It contrasts a little bit with, uh, I would say, the more uh, absolute protection that you see for, say, other amendments of the Constitution. Right? So in a way, you can say the probable cause warrant requirement is a qualified way of otherwise qualifying our right to be free from a search and seizure. In the First Amendment context, we don't say, well, if the government goes to a, a smart judge right, and gets a probable cause warrant, the government can stop me from speaking. Okay? Or even in the Fifth Amendment self-incrimination context, we don't say, well, if the government uh, is investigating an important crime, and they go and get a probable cause warrant alone, saying that, that there's probable cause to say that I committed the crime, uh, that alone would somehow overcome uh, the, my right against self-incrimination. The government has other ways it can do that, but not simply by going to a magistrate judge and getting uh, a probable uh, cause uh, warrant. And so another concern that's possible here in terms of uh, probable cause warrant and the probable cause requirement is what does it require? So if we're equating probable cause to unreasonableness, going to a judge, I encourage, it's great when <laughs> government agents will come to a judge uh, and make an application, show there's probable cause. That's, that's a procedural reasonableness. 
but does it look at any of the substantive reasonableness of the search? Okay, so, so consider, right, um, uh, is there a point in time, as the, uh, as the Supreme Court was confronted with in one case, 1985, Winston versus Lee, uh, the, uh, a, a, vict or a, a burglar, a uh, robber shot somebody, uh, or shot at somebody, and then uh, the victim shot back at the uh, robber, and the police decided, well, there's a bullet inside the uh, robber's gut. Uh, we're going to do surgery. <laughs> Open up the gut of the person and extract the bullet. Why? Because we have probable cause to do so. Okay? Right? And we'll get a warrant to do that, and we're going to get evidence of a crime. Um, and the Supreme Court said in that case, wait a second, wait a second, that's not going to be enough in that case where you're actually doing surgery on somebody to extract uh, evidence. Uh, that's an outlier case, uh, the Winston case in 1985. Other cases, uh, the court does not engage in a substantive reasonableness balancing concern. They look at procedural reasonableness. Did the government follow the right procedure and was there probable cause as determined by the magistrate uh, judge? Uh, they don't look at, well, how serious is the crime at issue, right? They don't look at uh, how important, apart from the seriousness of the crime, how important is this evidence to solving the crime? Uh, and they don't look at, in, uh, in these contexts, uh, is the intrusion that's contemplated by the government, is it against the suspect, the alleged wrongdoer, or is it against somebody else who is uh, merely kind of in possession of, uh, of evidence of someone else's crime. Uh, those are kinds of, this kinds of substantive criteria that might possibly uh, be, uh, be looked at uh, in that context. So uh, part of the challenge here, especially when we're looking at storing all, so much of our information on the cloud is should there be more in terms of a substantive justification uh, for a government search than uh, probable cause, procedural uh, justification to do so. The third question is, what are the rights of the people? And remember, this returns back to the text of, uh, of the Fourth Amendment. We talk about where it protects the right of the people. And it's not the only amendment that talks in the collective sense uh, about uh, the right of the people, although some talk in individual uh, uh, context. Uh, the Second Amendment talks about the right of the people with respect to the right to bear arms. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments talk about the right of the people. Now, if we're going to be uh, a textualist, Right, and here to the strict construction of what we see in the wording that would suggest that perhaps the Fourth Amendment creates a right that is pluralistic or collective in some sense. And, and I'd suggest that uh, in, in part, maybe uh, when we look at the text of the Fourth Amendment, when we talk about the, the rights, uh, the, excuse me, the right of the people, uh, that might suggest that, they, that the court could be challenged with trying to confront uh, a situation where uh, it has a mass surveillance technique that's being used by the government. Okay, so it can be the, the mass surveillance of tomorrow, uh, as I suggested, with the drones and the high-tech cameras, or it can be the mass surveillance techniques that exist and they're in operation today. Okay, on the left side, you've got cameras all over. Uh, many of our cities uh, uh, have uh, uh, cameras, posted cameras. They're vital in many cases to solving important crimes. And nobody, the Boston Marathon, other kinds of crimes have been solved by the fact that there are, 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 uh, are stationary cameras capturing uh, evidence uh, at some, uh, at, in uh, particularly important uh, places. Um, we have a license plate readers. You're at the bottom of this slide, you see a police uh, department's cruiser that essentially cr has a camera that knows how to train and capture every single license plate that gets in within its view and then collects the information, right? And then through networking can share that and create kind of a, a, a universal picture, right? Of, of where it is uh, cars have been on the road, what kinds of, uh, what cars have been on the road. And then we've had, as I've already talked about, cell towers uh, in terms of uh, the fact that they, we can go back in time and see from cell phone uh, records uh, where uh, particular people have been. So my query here is I don't have an easy answer at all to it, except to suggest that at least according to the, the, the text of the Fourth Amendment, uh, suggests that there may be some sort of collective uh, right here so that courts might be in a position, it won't be me, I'm just a trial judge, it will be a Supreme Court or some uh, higher court like that 
that will look at the issue of, well, uh, can uh, uh, and can and should uh, we be thinking about um, mass surveillance as a collective intrusion upon the people's right to be secure from unreasonable searches and seizures. Okay, so you could think of that in two ways. You could think about that uh, these mass surveillance techniques involve typically multiple steps of, an, of uh, especially when you have networked uh, devices, right, from cameras to the cell phones and things like that, where the government through uh, accumulation and aggregation of data is able to uh, create kind of a mosaic, right, a complete picture of, uh, of a person's uh, movements or various kinds of uh, activities. Um, you might think of it that way in terms of multiple intrusions on the same person, or you can think about it, is there some way in which the fact that there's an intrusion upon so many people, does that have its own Fourth Amendment constraint there? Um, traditionally, the answer would be no. Uh, that uh, under the well-established rules of standing doctrine, in the, at least in the federal courts, uh, one has to uh, show a personal injury to oneself and not, I cannot come into court and complain that somebody has intruded upon uh, my best friend's privacy or gone into my best friend's house or followed my best friend's house uh, or f best friend's car. So the question here would be, is there some way which the court could conceive of uh, of protecting it mass uh, collectively. And I would suggest here this ties back to what I had to say about um, uh, privacy in terms of ha privacy having a positive value because I would suggest it's only if we have a positively defined privacy right in terms of the social value of privacy, the social value that, that all the society recognizes when we give space and individual sovereignty over spaces in terms of how that creates the development of people and strengthen society as a whole, that courts could get in the position of looking at what are the overall social values that may counteract uh, mass surveillance techniques and make them possibly unreasonable searches or seizures, or at least subject to some sort of judicial uh, uh, review uh, in that context. And the last topic I'll talk upon, uh, touch upon very briefly is what remedies? What remedies exist? Uh, if the police are engaging in some kind of, uh, of intrusion, right, upon the home, okay? And you're looking at this, okay, and this might be that the uh, police officer is chasing a very dangerous uh, robber who's fled into the home, or, or it might be that the police officer is deciding to go and take a look uh, inside uh, what is uh, inside uh, the home. Um, a challenge, a real challenge for the courts in this context are the development of judge-made rules uh, that limit uh, the ability uh, or the inclination of courts uh, to look at and to reach and to decide whether a particular uh, governmental action uh, in fact involves a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And these come in two different ways. Uh, the first is in the context of criminal cases in which uh, the courts look at um, uh, the invocation of the exclusionary rule. And increasingly over the years, uh, the court has narrowed, after for many years, actually until 1961, not even really recognizing, uh, at least against states, uh, exclusionary rule in a criminal case that a Fourth Amendment violation uh, by the police could result in the exclusion of evidence. Uh, the courts since then have narrowed and narrowed the invocation of the exclusionary rule to the point now under the court's more recent pressing precedent in such a case as Herring versus the United States 2005, the Supreme Court has made clear that really it takes uh, a, at least a reckless or intentional violation of the Fourth Amendment. So essentially, uh, the Fourth Amendment prohibits what is unreasonable. It has to be an unreasonable, right, uh, 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 an unreasonable violation of the unreasonableness requirement, okay? So to the extent, uh, if I'm faced with a, if a court is faced with an exclusionary rule question, uh, if you can find that the police officers acted kind of reasonably in being unreasonable, got that, right? Um, the exclusionary rule would not apply in those uh, cases because the courts has made clear that the exclusionary rule is about deterring uh, um, and uh, that the society's interest in those uh, cases, according to the courts, uh, Supreme Court, is not to exclude uh, the evidence, even in the presence of a Fourth Amendment violation absent uh, reckless or intentional misconduct by the police. And the other area where Fourth Amendment issues come up is not in the uh, prosecution context so much as a civil liability uh, context. 
uh, in which uh, the, the society or a citizen will go after or make a, file a lawsuit against the police uh, for, say, a Fourth Amendment violation. And my task in those cases under well-established rules of qualified immunity is to ask, what did the police officer engage essentially in an unreasonable violation of clearly established law? Um, and, uh, and, and that can be a challenge for, uh, uh, for, for judges to decide, has there been a violation of clearly established laws as, as opposed to just what is a violation of established law, right? Or what is a violation of the Fourth Amendment? It involves a similar kind of inquiry. Um, I had one case uh, once uh, in which uh, I had um, uh, police officers um, arrested a 21-year-old boy. And um, he had, uh, they had suspected him of dealing in some um, oxycodone uh, tablets. And uh, they arrested him, they brought him to the station house, and they had said to him, do you have any more of those? And he said, I have a few more in my room at home. And he, um, the police uh, said, okay, they left him there and they went to his home. Uh, the boy's mother just died uh, in the last few months. His home he, he lived at with his uh, dad and uh, his uh, two younger siblings. Uh, I think one was 16, one was 11 years old. It was about 10 p.m. at night. The police knock on the door. Uh, the uh, dad comes up to the door, opens the door, and the police say to him, uh, sir, we have uh, got need to talk to you about your son's uh, drug problem. Would you uh, uh, like to talk to us about that? Can we come in? And he says, sure, and he lets them into the house, and they're inside the house, and they, and they change their tune. This is according to the dad's account, and I, I was at a procedural posture of the uh, case where I had to credit the father's account. And at that point, they say, sir, we want to go up to your son's room and search your son's room. And the father says, do you have a warrant? And the officers say, uh, no, we don't have a warrant. And he says, well, you may not go up to my son's room and search your son's room. And uh, after that, um, they said, well, you're making this difficult for us because we'll go get a warrant and we'll search the whole house. And they also said to him, we may report you to DCF, the Department of Children and Families. Um, and he protested that, and then they said, well, we're going to, uh, since you're not going to let us go search the room, we're going to go get a warrant. So they dispatched some of the officers, or several of the officers in the living room of the house, to go get the warrant. And he said, and the father said to the police, well, leave. Leave. Get out of my house. Re I revoke my consent for you to be in my house. And the officer said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to stay here to secure the house. Uh, where are your children? They're upstairs sleeping. Go wake your children. They told him to secure the house. He had to wake the children up and brought them into the, into the living room, uh, gathered them all in the living room. It's now past midnight. Uh, the officer's off getting a warrant. Uh, the, off, the, the dad gets so upset by this, he says to the 16-year-old child, uh, son, go up and get the, my, my Blackberry phone because <laughs> I want to take a video of what's going on here. And the officer said, no, you cannot go upstairs. Uh, for any reason, you cannot do that. And then they place the father under arrest for resisting uh, the police. They haul the father away, leaving the police with a 16-year-old, 11-year-old who should have been sleeping. It's late at night, it's past midnight. Uh, the police finally uh, do uh, oh, come back with a warrant. They do find some pills in, uh, in the son's home. So I was faced with a, no prosecution ultimately uh, uh, against the father. They never continued the charges against the father. The father uh, sues. And I was faced with the issue of, well, is this a violation of the Fourth Amendment? Uh, I wrote a ruling, a lengthy ruling some years ago, uh, concluding I thought it was. I thought if an unreasonable, this was an unreasonable search uh, by, uh, by the officers, crediting the father's account of, as I had to at this particular summary uh, judgment uh, stage. Um, and, uh, and I was reversed by the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit on the ground that uh, it was not a violation of clearly established law for what the officers uh, did uh, in, in that context. Uh, the, uh, the, the U.S. Court of Appeals for Second Circuit did not elaborate what was the clearly established law and the Fourth Amendment rights at issue in that case, but that's the kind of, the kind of factual scenarios that can arise in, uh, in, in this context. So um, in conclusion, uh, 
Uh, I, what I tried to talk about and review today uh, is trying to define what is a search and what is unreasonable. And I tried to suggest uh, that we need to be looking and thinking about a normative definition of what is uh, privacy over predictive expectations. I tried to suggest uh, that uh, unreasonableness um, should have a substantive component, not just a procedural component in terms of what uh, steps the police must take uh, before uh, doing uh, a search. Uh, and I've also tried to suggest that there may be room in the future uh, for evaluating uh, reasonableness in light of its collective effect on society as opposed to just on the individual. And I've also suggested that there may be a rule, role for the courts themselves um, to do more in this area in terms of defining what are the Fourth Amendment uh, uh, rights uh, at issue uh, rather than uh, uh, using and resorting to doctrines that prevent or that, that disincline the courts from clarifying the law in, this, uh, in these kinds of contexts and giving uh, necessary guidance uh, for uh, police authorities and uh, in some cases protection for citizens. So those are my comments at this point in time and I see we're, we've got a little bit of time for question and answer. Thank you, everybody. Yes, if you could just, if we don't mind just, whoever's got a question, I'll call on you. If you don't mind just standing up and saying your name, that would be helpful, if you feel like. I don't want to compel that. Well, no. uh, my name is uh, Professor Roger Masters from the Government Department. Great. And uh, I've been studying for some time an area which is really tricky, which is the area of biology and how that affects our political and legal rules. And some of the information that's critical now in many cases concerns such things as DNA and uh, you know, uh, blood type and all kinds of things like that. Uh, but there are also many ways that you can get at DNA that might be very strange as uh, searches. For example, uh, to check the DNA of two children if the father won't let you check his own body fluid or whatever. Right. That is, more and more, I think we're going to find ourselves confronting things where the physical objects are less important than the information. And in order to make judgments about that, the real problem is what is <laughs> procedurally reasonable or expected is going to get to be very hard because experts themselves will disagree. Yes. Uh, for instance, what's the reli reliability of a particular test of a particular body fluid for a particular kind of information? Right, right. That is, I, th I, think the, I think the courts are going to be in trouble. Yes. And, and so in a way, right, um, I think the response to what I've been suggesting, maybe it's too simplistic for me to say, well, the court shouldn't be just doing uh, this, you know, predictive, you assume the risk uh, that your DNA would get out there because uh, the courts will have a, a harder time figuring out what's a guiding rule to give guidance uh, because um, law enforcement officers, government officials, they need guidance. They should get guidance, reasonable guidance, um, from uh, the courts about what they can and cannot do. And they shouldn't be worrying and thinking of all the time, well, they're going to be subject to a lawsuit, right? Or other recrimination uh, uh, in the lack of a, a clearly established uh, rule. So the DNA um, uh, situation that you talk about uh, there, probably the suspect is not gonna, I think the suspect would have a hard time making a claim uh, that the police are invading his rights by going to other family members and taking that um, under existing doctrines. Um, there's other ways that the police could get it. That's oftentimes the police would get DNA evidence by essentially looking at if, you know, if a suspect has taken a drink of water, left a cigarette butt, and they obtain the DNA uh, in, in, in that context. I think the DNA by itself, if the police had to intrude upon the person's physical body to do it, that would be a search, very re highly regulable, but um, much harder if it's outside the person's body or personal possession. Yeah. Hi, uh, Alex Talcott, class of 04. Um, I think U.S. v. Miller, 1976, was the first decision in your remarks where Justice Blackmun was on the court. Yes. And I'm really interested in judicial process and academic process. You're obviously an intellectually curious person. I'm wondering when you prepare um, an address like this, whether you take personal note of 
the, the justice you clerked for, whether he was in the majority or not on any cases? Any uh, curiosity oh, sure. at all? Yeah, I'm always, it, yeah. And uh, certainly, I, I always take personal note of Justice Blackmun's positions on, 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 on those issues. Uh, his Fourth Amendment doctrine uh, evolved a bit over time. Uh, in his earlier years in the court, he was quite conservative on Fourth Amendment uh, issues. Yeah, that's a good question. Other? Yeah, yes, sir. My name is Harold Ravner. I'm class of 64 Great. with the Dartmouth Lawyers Association. Great. Um, my question is this. The, the entire concept of reasonable expectations at a time when, when technology is changing so fast, is it a doctrine that is really viable? I mean, the, my, the expectation of my granddaughter compared to my reasonable expectations are totally different. Yes. And um, how can a judge... Um, realistically apply the standards to both a population in which technology has changed right before his eyes, right. well before he went on court. Yeah, uh, that's a challenge. That's it's, it's exactly, it's Ravner. It's viable, yeah. viable at all. It, it, it's hard. I, I would suggest that, that you know, judges do that kind of um, uh, line drawing quite a bit. Basic tort law requires judges to look at what is reasonable, right? And so, a child's sense of what is reasonable or a teenager's sense of what is reasonable may differ from an older person's. So judges do, do, do have to do that, but it's still not a very simple uh, a task uh, for, for judges to do. I would suggest that they're, they're, they really need to be called upon to do that uh, because in some ways it can be too easy for judges just to rely on the idea that somehow you know, everybody assumes the risk. That, uh, uh, I think they have to draw the line in some way Hopefully, it would be in some sort of a positive way of what it is that the Fourth Amendment's trying to uh, protect. It's a very highly contestable uh, in terms of exactly what it's trying to protect. You can think about the various uh, aspects. Uh, some of the writers talk about the various aspects of is it is it protecting the right of just government ac against government access to the information, or is it uh, in the taking of the information? Or is it protecting against the government's right to process the information, right, big data? Uh, or to what extent is it protecting against the government's right to disseminate and to use the information in some way? So you have multiple aspects of, uh, of uh, the, the privacy, the overarching privacy concern. Yes, Professor Ruskies. <laughs> remedy. Uh, it, it, I, I can see it as an okay remedy with this negative idea of expectation, but if the positive idea of expectation is that, uh, you know, privacy is some, something related to human dignity or, uh, you know, your personal autonomy or something, then merely excluding the evidence doesn't seem to remedy the main kind of insult that the unreasonable search gives. So, Ah, yes. So that maybe that's another argument against the exclusionary uh, rule is that you've not made better from having your dignity affronted, except to the extent that I suppose for somebody who's suspected you. being a criminal, um, they say, I'll feel a lot better if I'm not in prison for a number of years. That will help my dignity. <laughs> but you're right, it's not, a, it's not a correspondence, exact correspondence uh, that way, and in the way like in tort lawsuits where we give money to victims often for uh, uh, dignitary type harms, emotional harms. Although arguably it would yeah. change law enforcement's conduct, right? So if there was suppression in a particular case, uh, this zone of privacy would be broadened and other law enforcement officers would say, this will happen in that case, so I'm not going to yeah, so it could. It doesn't benefit that particular That's right. So there's a, exactly, right? And that's a comment from uh, our chief law enforcement, federal law enforcement officer for Connecticut who's very familiar with these issues. Um, so, so there's the, the, what the court does now, uh, the recent jurisprudence has focused on the deterrent effect. To what extent is it deterring other officers perhaps from engaging in similar kind of, uh, of misconduct? Uh, and so the court is f refraining from excluding evidence in cases where it looks like the, the officer may have been negligent or, for example, uh, in a well-known case where an officer uh, applied for a search warrant 
Um, and the magistrate judge determined there was probable cause. And then the later <laughs> appellate court said, nah, there wasn't probable cause. Um, the court declined to exclude the evidence in that case, saying the officer could reasonably rely on the magistrate judge's determination uh, that uh, there was uh, probable cause. We did the officer did what we want officers doing, which is going to judges uh, and making a showing of probable cause before just doing a search uh, in the first place. Tim. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm still kind of in shock about the opinion that you described that was reversed by the Second Circuit. Um, I, you know, 1761, James Otis gave a speech against the writs of assistance. How could it possibly not be well established that if an officer is in your house and does not have a warrant and you have not given him consent, that that is a violation of the Fourth Amendment? No. I really don't understand it. Yeah. it, it I, I'm not easily shocked, but that really is shocking. Well, the, gra the ground cited uh, in that case by uh, the officers was that there were now exigent circumstances. So that's a well-established exception to the Fourth Amendment's uh, probable that's, cause warrant requirement. They said the exigency was we had knocked on the door, we were in the living room, okay? We told the dad that we wanted to get a warrant, and now if we left, the dad could go up and destroy the evidence in the son's room. All true, and yet they created the exigency. Yeah. So that seems pretty yeah. obviously yeah. flawed logic. Anyway. Yeah, no, well, I mean, that, that's the challenge. But, but, and, and so uh, the concern, I think, was um, uh, that um, uh, the law on this kind of factual situation where officers have done what's called you know, a knock and enter um, uh, like this, um, that uh, it was not clearly established that this tactic of essentially going in, creating the ex exigency in this way, um, was a violation of clearly established law. In fact, the Supreme Court had, had recently, fairly recently ruled in a different kind of context, uh, in Kentucky versus King, uh, uh, saying that simply because officers create an exigency does not mean there is not an exigency. <laughs> so uh, the Second Circuit concluded that uh, they didn't reach the, my determination that there had been a violation of the Fourth Amendment. They said it wasn't uh, a violation of clearly established law. Sometimes you gotta like look at the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My concern, and I wrote you know on remand about this. Uh, I, I okay, fine. It, I did not. I don't I'm not gonna take issue with the Second Circuit's conclusion. I follow the Second Circuit and anything it tells me. Um, I just encourage courts to articulate what is the legal standard. I didn't get that in this particular case. There was not an articulation by the circuit. Well, what does, does it violate the Fourth Amendment in that context? Um, I've had lots of cases uh, in which uh, I have applied qualified immunity and said whatever happened here, it wasn't a viola was not a violation of clearly established law. So I don't want to be too much, you know, <laughs> suggesting that every single case uh, I announce that. Um, my suggestion, though, is where if you see a case, if a judge sees a case where it's a common kind of situation where you could have uh, a common law enforcement tactic of essentially knocking, coming into the home, creating the exigency, as it were, uh, I think courts should step out and say this is what the, uh, uh, the rule of, of law is. Uh, as a federal district judge, um, for purposes of this is a little bit in the weeds, but for qualified immunity analysis, um, what I say as a district judge does not count, does not quote count for what is clearly established law. The Second Circuit and other circuits have made clear it has to be a rule of law that's announced by a federal appeals court or by the U.S. Supreme Court. <coughs> Professor Meyer. <laughs> I don't know if I need this, that could never be looked at. You know, I'm thinking of the Boyd case or the diary cases. Is there, is there a sense in which there's some kinds of things that are just so private one never has to disclose them? Well, um, I, I, that probably goes to the substantive reasonableness, and it might have been another factor that I would suggest maybe courts should be looking at in terms of not just procedurally reasonableness, but are there certain areas that are so intimate that, uh, that they should be immune from government uh, review. I think that's hard to say if, if it's you know, a mass a weapon of mass destruction or terrorism, that kind of very serious uh, kind of crime. But if it's a smaller kind of crime, 
Uh, maybe courts could be looking at, uh, well, is it reasonable to be looking at something like the very private diary uh, that somebody uh, uh, might, uh, might have? Again, we're back into line drawing problems, right? In a way, right, the, the procedural reasonableness rule that we have uh, where courts say, well, if they've gotten the warrant and there's probable cause, that's enough, uh, is easier to administer and it gives clearer guidance uh, to law enforcement officials. It just leaves those kinds of uh, uh, considerations a little bit on the side in terms of, well, what's the need to be looking at the most, very most intimate spots that we have, that, even if they're not inside our gut? Yeah. Um, so you raised a question of the, of the relevance of the evidence, how serious is the crime, um, the importance of the evidence to, to that, um, and, and suggesting that's not something to be taken into account here. But when the, ju when the magistrate decides to issue the warrant, are those relevant considerations? How does the magistrate decide whether no. to issue a warrant or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I get warrants occasionally uh, as, a, as a district judge. Um, I look to whether the warrant establishes probable cause uh, that a crime has occurred and probable cause to believe that the evidence that's being sought after uh, will be there. So will, will it exist in the house, right, or in the diary or, uh, or the like? Uh, to, for the crime for which there already is probable cause, uh, and I insist on particularity. A magistrate judge would insist on particularity in accordance with the uh, warrant requirements. But the magistrate judge, at, under present doctrine, is not licensed to essentially say, well, how important is this crime? Uh, or, you know, will it intrude upon third parties' uh, um, uh, expectations? And what is the sensitivity of the area that's being um, uh, searched. It's not part of the calculus at this point. Now to say it's not part of the, the calculus for the judge doesn't mean it won't necessarily be part of the calculus for the law enforcement officials. Because I was a prosecutor for ten, almost 10 years, right? So that could be something that I'd be thinking about as a law enforcement official also upheld, sworn to uphold the Constitution in terms of, well, what can I do to make sure that this, um, uh, the, the search that occurs here is appropriately uh, circumscribed for the privacy rights that might be at issue there. These are just immensely difficult issues because so many, of, so many times what law enforcement officers do in all good faith is they find evidence that's vital to solving crimes and protecting people. So um, it can be difficult <laughs> uh, when we talk about expanding uh, the roles and the, or the or the uh, scope of inquiry that we have today. Anybody else out there? Great. Thank you all. Okay.